Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's always an uh, onerous task to give the last speak or last talk just before lunch. So please bear with me. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers, that is uh, Dr. Pradeep Bhardwaj, Jan Nakali, and all the other dignitaries like Mr. Rajesh Shrivastav, Major Alwalia sir, Dr. Arun Gupta, the DMC President, Dr. Dinesh Patra, Dr. Dharmendra Nagar, Dr. B. K. Rana, Dr. Rai, Professor Khokar, Group Captain Sanjeev Sood, Dr. Rakesh Gupta, and a host of other luminaries who have come here. So let me first start with the Indian Healthcare Services. This offers a very large growth opportunity in India to us because we are 123 crore people right now and expected to touch 142 crores by 2026. Our healthcare expenditure is about 420,000 crores or 4.2 trillion Indian rupees. Though the country's GDP is growing at a healthy 7.4%, it is sad that only 4% of this is spent on healthcare and the government contributes only 1%. This spending is indeed very low as compared to USA which is 17.1%, Brazil 9.7%, UK 9.1%, Russia 6.6%, Vietnam 6%, China 5.6% and Thailand 4.6%. However, the private expenditure, contrary to popular thinking on, health, on Indian healthcare, is 70%. So the government spends only 30%, and we in the private sector spend about 70%. But the good thing is that this entire healthcare industry is going at a healthy 12% uh, every year, or 12% CAGR as we call it. The Indian insurance or healthcare insurance market is worth 17,500 crores or just about 8% of the total spend. However, our diagnostic services industry is worth 37,000 crore rupees. This includes both radiology and pathology and is expected to grow by a healthy 17% to nearly 60 or 65,000 crores or nearly 100 uh, billion dollars, uh, ten billion dollars by 2018. About our company, we are the first Indian diagnostics company that went for an IPO and whose listing opened only on the 23rd of December this year. I am told that our IPO garnered an overwhelming demand of 15,000 crores, much above the 640 crores that were needed. The institutional investor portion of the IPO achieved an oversubscription of over 63 times, the highest amongst any IPO this year and witnessed participation from over half a million retail investors. Now talking about ourselves, we are an established healthcare brand in the diagnostic services. We have a pan-India coverage with 172 laboratories that includes one national reference lab in sector 18 in Rohini, 1,554 patient service centers or collection centers, and more than 7,059 pickup points like Medanta Hospital, AIM, Safajan, Max, Jaslo, Yunavati, etc. Our test menu consists of 1,934 different pathology tests. And these are accommodated in 1,100 test panels. And we also offer low-end radiology and cardiology tests that number another 1,561 tests in about 20 labs in India. Last year, we tested 10 million patients, or nearly 1 crore patients. That resulted in about 22 million tests. We have nearly 3,300 employees on our payroll, that would be including about 200 pathologists. We offer different tests in disciplines of biochemistry, hematology, clinical pathology, microbiology, basic radiology, cardiology, 
molecular diagnostics, flow cytometry, atomic absorption spectrometry for trace and heavy metals, FTIR for kidney stone analysis, genetic cytogenetics, histopathology, and I would like to touch upon histopathology. Our histopathology department is the biggest in the world. We test 1,000 biopsies a day, which is a world record, and 30% of these turn out to be malignant. Generally speaking, pathology is by definition the study of disease of the human body. Since we are living in a world where the practice of medicine has completely become evidence-based, it is no surprise that all doctors, be it a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, ophthalmologist or an ENT surgeon or a gastroenterologist, cardiologist, nephrologist, gynecologist, urologist or a skin specialist all have to rely on the pathologist report. As an example, a patient coming to a physician for complaints of fever of a few days duration could be suffering from malaria, influenza, or viral fevers like dengue, chikungunya, swine flu, hepatitis, typhoid fever, autoimmune disease like SLE, leukemias, urinary tract infections, or what is most common in India, tuberculosis, which kills two persons in India every three minutes. It is for the pathologist to take appropriate samples from the patient and test them, establish the diagnosis so that the physician can give the correct treatment to the patient. A complete different scenario could be that of a lady for over two years generation who has been married but is not having children, what we call in our doctor's jargon as suffering from infertility. The gynecologist orders tests like special x-rays, ultrasounds, CT scans, various blood tests, and in the blood test, she also orders a few hormones, and particularly a hormone by the name of prolactin is found to be very high. A diagnosis of a pituitary tumor in the brain is established, known as prolactinoma, and is confirmed by CAT scan also. The lady start, is started on a drug known as bromocriptine, and a few months later, the lady delivers a very healthy baby. <coughs> Therefore, it will not be of any surprise for you to understand that more than 70% of all medical decisions are taken on the basis of lab tests. Our name is synonymous with pathology testing in India, and we run our healthcare business with a lot of passion, vision, and discipline. We bring to the table very strong values for over 66 years, giving quality pathology services to millions of our countrymen every year in most of the parts of the country, and we would now like to extend that to the rest of the people in all parts of the country, which we need to four towns and even the districts. We believe in total quality management, which we call as TQM, and that is to get the test result right the first time and to get it right every time. We run our business with a lot of conscience and with strong moral ethics. We are by training compassionate and give the much needed human touch and the same best quality result to the patient, be it the president of India or a rickshaw puller on the street. We are driven by a feeling of care and empathy for our patients and thus we were able to touch the lives of nearly 10 million patients and clients last year. We consider it our moral duty to improve the health of our people by taking the lead to make high quality and innovative diagnostics accessible to our people at affordable prices. Now, I'll tell you my story. May I have the first two slides, please? Slide number two and three. For me personally, the battle to become a doctor soon began after the realization at the age of 15 when I was the best cadet in NCC Navy at Modern School New Delhi, that I could not join the National Defense Academy, my seniors are sitting here, to become a fighter pilot in the Navy, and I did not have the bio biology as a subject in the school because I had a mistaken belief that by studying the alternative subject to medical drawing, I would be better able to chart the course of a ship, in this case, an aircraft carrier. I also had to crank the belief, you are aware that boys are when they are teenagers, can be very opinionated that boys who studied biology were not men. 
and boys who studied arts were in fact in between men and women. So my own transformation from a man to a boy started in right earnest and truly hated study, studying botany. And I remember asking my biology teacher in school exam that he should tell me as a special case the beginning of the page number and the ending of the page number that had the answer to a particular question because I had mostly memorized the entire botany book by A.C. Dutta. I had obviously no clue to the nature of the question, leave aside the answer, and for this indiscretion, he yelled at me and twisted my ears. I'd just like to clarify, I've been given half an hour actually. I was told that I have to speak for half an hour. I'm very sorry to cut short, sir. I guess it is. No, I've got a written speech, no, I can't cut it short. Please continue. On a different note, my indifference to anything medical probably started when, as a little boy, I used to be poxed as to why my father, who started the lab in 1949, would kill the rabbits with whom I loved playing with in our house. That also had my father's pathology lab on Hanuman Road. May I have the slide number five and six, please? This, I learned later, was carried out to sacrifice the animal for studying its ovaries after injecting it with the lady's urine for the then only available pregnancy test. I took over the lab in 1977 after the untimely demise of my father. At that particular point of time, I was a lecturer in the quality at Armed Forces Medical College, Pune, where I was also the warden of the boys' hostel. May I have the slide number seven and eight, please? By the time when I joined my father's pathology practice, I had started to pride myself by believing that I knew everything that was needed to be known in the country. You can imagine my disbelief when on taking over the reins of a lab, I discovered the shortcuts and the cutting of corners in lab testing that were taking place. So it was no surprise that my first couple of years <coughs> in private practice were completely spent on putting in place newer test methods and protocols that involved making home-brewed reagents for biochemistry and other tests. There was no culture of buying kits as a display from abroad, as there were very unfriendly import policy at that time from the government of India. This involved ordering raw material from Indian suppliers and then using sophisticated lab instruments at that point of time, like a single pan metal electronic balance, using very sensitive pH meters, surveying the market always and installing very sensitive spectrophotometers, single well gamma scintillation counters, filtering dangerous radioactive material by mouth, and many such mundane laboratory tasks. And thus started my indoctrination into the beautiful world of private pathology practice. Now I will narrate some game changes which I faced. To my mind, 1981, the introduction of thyroid tests in a private laboratory for the first time in India and the introduction of the first automated blood chemistry autoanalyzer in northern India were the real game changers in the healthcare industry. When I came into the industry, there was no T3T or TSH possible. We all used to do protein bound iodine. So I was the first one in a private uh, practice to start doing these things. In 1982, we created the hub and spoke model and introduction of franchising for the first time in healthcare in the world's first ever collection center. The current number of collection centers, as I told you, is maybe 1,500. So may I now have slowly slides number 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. I'm sorry, I don't have a computer here, so I have to request my friend there. In 1986, I introduced the first computerized, dedicated lab information management system, also known as LIMS, for the first time in India. The lab when I joined in 1977 was testing about 30 patients a day and by 1986 the workload had gone up to nine, about 60 to 80 patients a day and today we can test anywhere up to 50,000 patients a day. This required the services of, I'm talking about pre-1986, of two typists who would continue to bang on the typewriters from 12 noon onwards. The day one of the typists was absent, all hell would break loose. Thus, the first software program was written for a lab in, in India. We were 
thus able to fully computerize lab operations. We did not have type the, the reference range or what we call the normal values after each and every test. And the abnormal results would automatically get highlighted. So this was the second game changer as far as I'm concerned in the lab. In 1989, we were the first private lab in India to start HIV and AIDS testing. And the introduction of the second generation autoanalyzer known as a Hitachi 717 was the next game changer in the industry. And we became the first lab outside Western Europe, Middle East, Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and all the way to Japan to install this instrument. This instrument was capable of doing 600 tests per hour. In 1994, Corning Clinical Labs, now known as Quest Laboratories, invited me to USA to become their partner and to visit their head office or head lab in Peterborough, New Jersey, and also to visit the Corning headquarters. In 1996, the introduction of transportation boxes for carrying of samples was also a game changer. They were made from thermocol and had two frozen gel packs and sponges inside, all made in-house. They could keep the blood and other samples cold, that is between a temperature of 2 to 8 degrees centigrade uh, for 48 hours, even when the outside temperature was 45 degrees centigrade. In 1998, the third largest lab chain in Australia, known as Rebels Pathology, started operations in India. I geared up to take the competition head on by creating more labs and more collection centers. This story is similar to McDonald's entering Philippines and, by, and being beaten there by the local fast food chain known as Johnny B. You can say it was another David and Goliath story. Next, uh, slide number 15, please. In 1999, we became the first Indian lab to install the world's most prestigious triple G lab software or DEMS. It gave us in India for the first time a true bi-directional interface connectivity. And gave connectivity between collection centers and the main lab between two collection centers and became the backbone of future connectivity between us and hospital labs. Though the software was in Unix and the data by, database was Unix by 2000, its sturdiness was truly really amazing. Later in the year 2012, we went for an upgrade to even a more sophisticated software by the name of Star Links, installed by an American company known as Abbott, which cost us maybe 20 crores. In 1989, we further introduced the Hitachi 717 chemistry autonomizer, again for the first time between uh, Eastern Europe on one side and Japan on the other side, and this was capable of doing 800 tests per hour. We also introduced the unique blood collection system known as vacuum tailors uh, at that time for the first time in India. And at that time, BD was not even present in India. So I introduced the vacuum tailors much before Beckton Dickinson came to India. In 1999, in the year 2003, we rejected an offer of 50% JV with Quest Diagnostics for reasons which I can't explain right now. And in 2005, Westridge Capital Partners acquired 26% stake and includes about 28 crores in our business. Also in 2005, we corporatized our business by the induction of a professional CEO, Om Manchanda, a former IIM Ahmedabad graduate and an ex Hindustan lever, one center in the Randbach C person. Can we have the slides number 16 to 21, slowly now? In 2010, another game changer was opening of Asia's biggest laboratory, having a covered area of 85,000 square feet at Rohini. And finally, in 2015, perfecting the hub and spoke model by operating now 172 labs, 1,500 collection centers, and picking up samples from another 7,000 pickup points and testing nearly 50,000 patients a day from India's biggest test menu. Now, the, my personal mantras, and my first thing which I would like to, slide number 22 and 23 please, that we as Indians, we actually fear failure. We should not fear failure. By and large, many Indians are afraid to fail, and therefore one of the best policies we as Indians have invited is that if you don't 
work at all, you cannot fail. This is in stark contrast to the most successful Western countries that keep on trying and ultimately success comes. Remember that in every failure, there is a very strong learning that will prepare you to success in your next venture. My mantra in life has been to do adequate research, plan, and then execute. This mantra will normally not take you that down, but there can be times when you may feel that the world has come crashing on you. Slide number 24. Thomas Alva Edison, the noted inventor of God knows how many things in this world, was also the inventor of the electric bulb. But I bet you don't know that before he got the electric bulb glowing for the first time, he had failed 10,000 times. And when somebody asked him, so why did you fail 10,000 times? He said, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I found out 10,000 ways of how not to make a bulb. My DGZ, good afternoon, sir. Next, I would like to say that we Indians are also very intelligent individually, but I keep telling everyone that collectively we could not have gathered a bigger bunch of fools. For this, I will tell you a story of the famous actor politician Shatru Ganzela. He said in a very old edition of film magazine Filmfare, when asked by a reader in the question and answer column, that name three people whom you like best. And what Short Kansina had to say was, three people, I, me, and myself. So there was no fourth person whom he liked. That, this about sums up the entire story of us Indians who like ourselves so much that we become incompatible to work as a team. At this juncture, I would always like you to remember the credo is there in addition to Major Aluwalia, is there anybody else also from IMA, Indian Military Academy? Is it? I would like to like to like you to remember the credo on the oak paneling of the eastern entrance of the Chetwood Hall of the Indian Military Academy by Field Marshal Philip Warhouse Chetwood, a British cavalry officer who became commander in chief in India and excerpted it address delivered at the formal inauguration of the Academy in 1932. We have the 25th slide, please, 25. This credo reads, the safety, honor, and welfare of your country comes first, always, every time. The honor, welfare, and comfort of the men you command comes next. Your own ease, comfort, and safety comes last, always, and every time. It is known as the Chetwood motto, and is the motto of the officers passing out of the Indian Military Academy. They are known as gentlemen cadets. Now this can be reframed by you, all whom are called gentlemen managers or GMs by replacing the word country by your company, in which you are the employer or are the promoter, or you the employee or the promoter, which would then read as follows. The safety, honor and welfare of your company comes first, always and every time. The honor, welfare and comfort of the men you command comes next. Your own ease, comfort and safety comes last, always and every time. I would like to emphasize that teamwork is what is going to get you and our country ahead in these trying times and in possible times of recession. If you inculcate the fundamental spirit of teamwork, only then will your country elements of factors which give rise to these full-fledged diseases are purely due to yourselves because of your altered lifestyle. Thus, these diseases are also known as lifestyle diseases and whose advent is purely in your hands. Therefore, I implore all of you not to fall prey to these so-called lifestyle diseases. For this, you should have to exercise for a minimum of half an hour, at least five days in a week. You can take up simple walking, jogging, swimming, or any other activity which burns up calories. You would be pleasantly surprised to know that long distance runners and other athletes secrete large quantities of a hormone in the brain known as beta endorphin. This is a morphine like alkaloid and gives you a natural high. It is for this reason that you find sportsmen to be jovial persons who do not brood and are liked by everybody. 
See the ever smiling face of cricketer Dhruv Singh Sidhu, and you understand what I am saying. So now you can see that not only regular exercise will keep you all healthy from the above killer diseases, but shall also keep you mentally alert and capable of generating great ideas and taking your company to even greater heights. Now, the last question which I'm going to answer for you is that how did you transform from a family business into a corporate entity? So here, I realized very early in my professional life that being a good doctor did not automatically translate into running a successful organization that could be scaled up earning higher revenues. I had been looking for a CEO since 1995 and finally after trying to unsuccessfully hire an Indian Institute of Management and the Bad Lady in 2003, we were finally able to hire a CEO in 2005. I was also firmly aware of the fact that the new CEO would have to be given the pride of place in our organization. He had to be allowed to make independent decisions and would not be an automatic yes man. This is precisely the reason why professional CEOs are kept, aren't they? I also became more and more aware of the fact that my role would now be more in strategic planning and not in hands-on day-to-day operation role. The same thoughts were reinforced by my professors in the Indian School of Business where I attended the strategic management course, Professor Hardeep Singh and Professor Zak. A similar story was there as in a case study from Cisco Systems of the USA which is now uh, a revenue uh, model of 50 billion US dollars company. This company was also started by a husband and wife team of computer hardware specialists, namely Leonard Bosak and Sandy Lerner at Stanford University. Though they were excellent technocrats, they were poor managers. They hired a CEO from Honeywell Corporation, known as John Chambers, who just retired, and they never looked back. You can say that Cisco and us have a same kind of a uh, background minus the revenues. And finally, the question, what is the mantra for success? May I have slide number 27? This I have learned from the management and the accreditation people. Dr. Rana is sitting right in front of me. It is known as KISS. Keep it short and simple. So that is what you have to uh, you know, think about. Also, please remember Professor C.K. Pralad, who was an Indian management guru in Michigan University, he died two years ago. And he gave the famous theorem or famous equation known as C is equal to 1 and R is equal to N, especially if you are in the healthcare industry or the service industry. Now, C stands for one customer, and R, means, R is equal to N means resources are N, which is innumerable. Your entire company's resources or say the armed forces, medical services, direct resources should be concentrated into servicing each and every one customer at a time. Have a great attitude and most importantly, you must have fire in your belly. Also, do not get baited into accepting other people's ideas, especially on diversification. I have been given a new project every day by well wishers that why don't you go into ophthalmology, eye change, dental care, IVF clinics, etc. but I start to pathology testing. And so, the uh, others are on a more private level. I think it's because we don't have much time. We are going to, uh, you know, uh, cut short here. So in the end, I would like to reiterate that there are one billion people living in India. They are waiting to be tested for reasons I have mentioned above. And I plan to reach every district and village. Secondly, money is a big factor in one's life for roti, kapra, and makan, and other objects for personal enjoyments. But remember, money can buy you anything, but it cannot buy you internal happiness. I think the minister was saying the same thing. Be happy and contented. If money alone could buy happiness, all the Tatas, Birlas, and Amalis, and Mithras of the world would be saints and gods. You would be hanging their photographs everywhere. But are they anywhere near that? No. So pretty much farthest from it. See what has happened to Western societies like the USA, UK, where ignorance, arrogance, greed have got the better of them. 
So let that not happen to you all, and do not burn your candle at both the ends. Thank you very much.